good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Group participation. I, I think Brian and Gordy and I will have some questions for you, so please give us feedback. Uh, you'll notice on many of the seats there's a book, and so if you didn't get one before we're done or, or after the sessions are done, you can come up front because there's always some in the front row, and uh, grab a book on your way out that Brian was so nice to, uh, to provide to us. Brian is the, the crux of this afternoon's presentation. Uh, on moving from an insurance buyer to an insurance owner as his company has done. So you'll hear more from him in a few moments. Um, I'm Andy Johnson with Captive Resources, Executive Vice President. I've been with Captive Resources for 25 years now and, uh, and loving every minute of it. This is just fantastic, especially when we can give out ice cream and smoothies. So happy to be here, happy to be a part of this. You can see Brian Falco from Jetco, who gave us the books, will be speaking in a few moments. And then Gordy Padera from Gallagher Bassett Services, uh, one of our very valuable uh, business partners will be uh, wrapping things up towards the end about some of the resources available to take you and change people's mindset from being an insurance buyer to an insurance owner, which is something we've emphasized for many, many years at Captive Resources. So now if we can get the remote working. Um, so I will cover a little bit of an overview of what Captive Resources does. Uh, our uh, role in, 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 in forming and consulting to and working with captives and captive members for the last 30 years or so. Uh, actually, if you look in one of the magazines, it talks about the oldest captives here in Cayman. One of them is Raffles Insurance Limited that George started back in 1986. So George, take some credit for that. One of the oldest captives on the island. Now, congratulations, <laughs> a fantastic run with that. Brian will talk about Jetco Deliveries, that's his company, his company's journey from buyer to owner in one of those groups called Affinity Insurance Limited, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on that in a moment, and then like I said, Gordy will talk about resources brought to bear to help make that transition. So, a little bit about Captive Resources, again, the company itself was formed in 1989. We currently have, that's a typo, 35 group captives that we consult to, along with our sister company, Kensington Management, which are a number of our friends are here in the audience this afternoon as well. And approaching about 4,000 companies across the United States. And that's everything from trucking companies to construction to temporary services to manufacturers to, to service and enterprises, you name it. We probably can find a home for any company out there in the United States that's a good company, treats its people well, has a culture like Brian's company, and that wants to move its company from good to great. We can pretty much find a home for them in one of those 35 group captives of about 4,000 companies across the country. $2 billion in premium, and if you were listening to some of the stats this morning, that accounts for roughly 20% of the premium in captives in Cayman. And all of our captives are domiciled here in Cayman. And over the last 20 some years, over $2 billion has been returned to our members. That's a lot of money. I don't know about you, but $2 billion is a lot of money. And the way it works is if companies pay attention to their employees, their staff, their clients, their <coughs> safety efforts, the money that they pay in, in premium comes back to them, plus investment, plus interest. It's been a fantastic thing. Worked quite well for many, many years. Like I said, $2 billion returned to those members over the years. We have a staff of 185 people in Schaumburg, Illinois, soon to be Itasca, Illinois. We're moving our office soon. And we have resources on hand hence the name, Captive Resources, that are all independent of any enterprise out there. We are a, a, our own company, We're not a part of a brokerage, not a part of an insurance carrier. But we have safety people on staff. We have claims management people on staff, uh, underwriting operations, finance, all the pieces you need to make a captive function. We have those resources in-house, hence the, the brilliant name, Captive Resources, that was uh, added to the company many, many years ago. So that's a little bit about Captive Resources. Now, the group that Brian is a part of is called Affinity Insurance Limited. It was formed in 1995. One of our earlier captives we started uh, way back when pretty much formed one or two captives a year for the last 25 years and added members through good times and bad times in the economy. All of our captives have continued to grow. This group, Affinity, has 497 members. It's probably 500 today. Maybe somebody at Kensington might know the statistic, but it continues to grow through a fantastic network of brokers around the country. It's over $400 million in premium in that group alone, and they have returned, over the course of their time, over $200 million in member dividends, member premium uh, dividends, back to the members of their company. Brian's company joined in 2015, joined the Affinity Group. 
says all lines, not quite all lines, really. Workers' compensation drives the bulk of the premium in affinity and most of our captives, although we do have a captive for property and, and, and health benefits and 831Bs and those, but workers' compensation is what pretty much drives the premium that members pay into our groups, as well as auto and general liability. We don't get into exotic coverages, no med mal, things like that, but it's pretty much the bread and butter of most companies in the United States is their work comp, their auto, and their liability. 240 different industry codes are serviced across the affinity membership, so you can imagine it's a, a wide breadth of companies across the United States, and they are pretty much in all 50 states, the affinity group, as are uh, a nice microcosm of our groups in total. And again, the resources that are brought to bear by captive resources and the different service partners that work with us to make this captive so successful are member workshops, where we bring the members together to share ideas which are similar to this conference, where Brian could come and his risk management people and his safety and his claims people all come together. They have member portals where the members can post questions that other members in the room can then answer about a variety of subjects related to the captive and the insurance enterprise. They can make connections. We have seen over the years members uh, do business with one another, members buy one another, members' children get married to one another. We've seen all sorts of wonderful things happen. Some divorces, some th other things. <laughs> mostly good things, mostly good things. Uh, a, a, a wide breadth of safety consultants around the country, which Gordy's company provides a great number of those. Uh, and Gallagher Bassett does the claims management services for the affinity group. Uh, but we bring all these resources together, and the members bring the resources together. So again, that's something you wouldn't see in the traditional insurance world, but when you become an, an owner of an insurance enterprise, you take things a little bit differently, and you become uh, more, more, more likely to share ideas that in the past you may never have had that opportunity. And that's that whole mentality of taking off your business owner's hat when you walk in the room to a captive board meeting and putting on your insurance company owner's hat. And that's what we do at Captive Resources, is making that transition, helping companies like Brian's do that, although he was well on the way to doing that when he came in the door anyway. So um, the green book in front of you has a little uh, photograph again of Brian, if you want to take a look at that, although Brian's been working out lately. He's lost a little bit of weight since this picture was taken, so congratulations to you. But Brian is the uh, CEO of Houston-based Jetco Delivery. Brian has been uh, has 25 years of business experience in safety-sensitive industries, including as Executive Vice President of Recycle America Alliance and is author of Driving to Perfection, Achieving Business Excellence by Creating a Vibrant Culture. And that's from Two Harbors Press from 2014. He's a Wisconsin native. He lives in Houston with his wife, Cheryl, and Cheryl is here somewhere also. So say hello to Cheryl when you get a chance. Uh, with his three children, just weathered the storms of Houston, so he can tell you some stories about that. But he's here to share his experience about moving that, that, that barrier from going from insurance buyer to insurance owner. So please welcome Brian Felico. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, the topic of making the change from insurance buyer to insurance owner. It reminded me of a story, uh, two best friends, Billy and Eddie. And these, these are guys that were best friends since they were kids. And Billy and Eddie loved nothing more uh, than to hunt, and especially hunting moose. So every summer, Billy and Eddie take a plane up to Canada, they fly a commercial jet into Thunder Bay and then a small little private jet, a uh, little charter, way up north to, to hunt moose. And last summer was a good one. They shot six moose. And uh, the pilot of the small plane came to pick them up and Billy and Eddie started to load the moose onto the plane. And um, the pilot said, six moose plus you two guys? I, we, I'm not taking that, uh, that. We're never going to get off the ground. Well, Eddie looked at the pilot and said, you know, last year we shot six moose and the pilot took, took them. So the pilot, being a macho guy, uh, said, okay, if you did it last year, I'll do it this year. So they load the six dead moose on the plane, Bill and Eddie get on, plane goes to the runway, taxis, takes off, up, 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 boom, down. Fortunately, everybody survived. But when Bill and Eddie got out, Billy kind of <coughs> you know, got the smoke out of his lungs, looked around and said, where are we? And then he said, I don't know, but it sure looks like where we crashed last year. <laughs> point, point, point being that, uh, point being that, that, you know, when we made the decision to move into a captive, uh, we, we felt like we'd gotten to the point where we were doing things over and over the same way 
and, and getting the same result in conventional markets. And we had very good insurance coverage, very good carriers, people who I would say nothing bad about. But for example, you know, we had our, our auto liability was here, our workers' comp liability was there, and some years we'd have really good experience in both. Other times we would have maybe a little experience, bad experience in one or the other. And the captive gave us the chance to basically combine our risk pool into one. And when I looked at our 10 years of history, I saw, you know, that in any one year, our loss ratios combined were low. I mean, we never really hit a, a, a concerning loss ratio where in a given year we may have under one line of coverage for the other. So trying not to be like Billy and Eddie, we said we're going to make a move into a, a, a situation where we're in, in more control, uh, where we can combine our, our various coverages, uh, comp and auto, are the biggest ones um, into one, and where we have more say in our in, in our, our destiny, uh, and have great partners to work with. So we changed the game for our company, and for people who are, who've made the change or are, are considering making the change, just a couple thoughts. Um, and, and what I'm going to do is uh, share some um, some thoughts with you, some 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 uh, slides out of a keynote presentation I, I give. 99% of my time is spent running my company, but I do hit the road maybe 15 days a year uh, uh, and, and, and do some public speaking on the topic of co company culture and specifically safety culture. And there's four points I want to walk away with is that, first of all, if we're going to change and we're going to work inside of a captive, we've got to understand that, that safety is a hardcore business proposition. Uh, yeah, it's the right thing to do, and that's why I do it, but there's a hardcore business proposition associated with it. It's all about your front lines. I mean, you know, we, we can only solve so much in the boardroom. Those of us in the boardroom are not the smartest guys in the room uh, when it comes to safety and knowing where the risks are. You got to have frontline engagement. Um, then the nexus between accountability, safety, and insurance outcomes uh, is, is critical. And finally, we'll talk about maybe a different way to approach metrics. I think we're drowning in a sea of spreadsheets. And so I want to talk about leading indicators, not lagging indicators. And I want this to work. Um, yeah, just bear with me. So this was issued, this, this statement was issued by McKinsey and Company back in February of this year. And I think this says it better and more concisely than I've ever seen it. It says companies are no more successful at overhauling their performance and organizational health than they were 10 years ago. A blind spot seems to be the failure to involve frontline employees and frontline managers. And that is the truth. And, and, and I think you see it everywhere where you've, we've got to bring frontline employees, the people who are actually executing on safety, into the safety culture, into the safety uh, uh, mission of our companies. You know, I, I talk about brands. We all have a, a brand. My company has one, your company has one. Some of these companies have great brands. I think we're staying in one right now. A couple of these companies uh, have done quite a number on, on their brands uh, over the past year, uh, uh, and not, not in a good way either. But our brand is nothing more than a reflection of who we are as a company. Your marketing efforts and, and all the sizzle goes so far. What's at the core is who we are and how we operate. And more and more companies do not want to do business with rogue operators, unsafe companies, right? When I bought my company uh, in 2006, getting customers to talk about safety was like pulling teeth. It's like, come on, let's get to the part about the price. Now, it's really changed. We've won more business than I can tell you because of our safety record, because of our safety culture, because of how we approach safety in a way that just in 10, 10 or 11 short years was not the case. And I see that trend continuing to grow. I see, I see customers, whether they're you know, uh, uh, patients uh, in, in, in healthcare facilities, whether they're customers of, of a logistics company, a manufacturing company, people are more safety aware than they were not long ago. It is your ticket, in my mind, to staying in business, to keeping the best employees, and keeping and uh, attracting the best customers. We can all get customers. That's no problem. Can we get the right customers? And I think having a safety culture is more and more the key to getting the right customers. And if you like this slide, 
Um, as we were moving into the captive, right, because in a captive scenario, I think you, you know, you're, you're going to eat more of your cooking, right? You're going to get more in premium refund the better you do, but, but there's, a, there's a downside to that, right? You've got exposure um, if, you, if you don't perform. And so we asked ourselves some core questions, which is how strong is our safety culture? You know, were we good or were we lucky? Um, are we really living our values? We certainly, I think our employees uh, understand our values. You can have a value statement on a wall in a conference room that nobody reads because nobody goes in the conference room. It's are you operationalizing your values? Are you living them? And are you teaching your employees how to live them? And are we truly providing safety leadership? And I think today, uh, uh, in, in Debbie's presentation, she made a great example, uh, used a great example where, you know, are we, are we really providing safety leadership? Meaning that we're willing to give up revenue or a piece of business if we can't do it safely, right? That's, that's when it really hits. It really hits when a customer is pounding us to get something done and we don't feel we can do it safely. Are we going to just do it? Or are we going to call a timeout and either figure out how to do it right? And if we can't figure that out, then not do it at all. And that's where it comes to risk versus chance, right? Can anybody in this room manage chance? It's impossible. You can't manage chance. Uh, to use an, an example from, again, from Debbie's presentation on texting and driving, you know, I could text and drive for the next 100 days and not have an accident. Does that mean it's safe? Absolutely not. It means that I'm not too bright and I'm lucky, right? It's a matter of when. You can't manage that. You've really got to focus on managing risk, right? Risk is something that you can assess and you can manage, right? You can say, okay, this is a hazard of this job. It's an inherent hazard in what my drivers do, what, what might happen in a hospital. You can get your arms around that and you can develop processes, procedures, hire the right people. So this is about managing risk. And I've seen too many people have this attitude, well, famous last words here, we've always done it this way. I hate those words. And, and are you lucky? Are you taking a chance that you just happen to get lucky on for 10 years? Because if you are in the 11th year, the day of reckoning will come. Are you really managing risk by having a process-driven culture with the right people? This thing loves me. Um, bear with me. And that's where it comes down to knowing the difference between values and priorities. We mix it up too often, okay? In order to have a really strong safety culture, we have got to distinguish between values and priorities. Well, let's put it this way. Values are the glue that binds our organization together. I can't tell you what your values should be, but what I can say is that once you've established your values, you don't negotiate them. And we don't sit around in a strategic planning meeting in November or December saying, well, what should our values be in 2018? It doesn't work that way. Your values don't change. We don't compromise our values. On the other hand, priorities change by the day, right? I could come in to my office 7 o'clock in the morning with a to-do list, phone rings, out the window, right? Everything got rearranged. That's okay. That's part of the joy of being in business. But you can never let those burning fires in the priority category compromise your values. And I've seen it happen too much, right? You know, uh, in our industry, uh, drivers are only allowed to drive uh, a certain amount of time in a given day, uh, work a certain amount of time in a given day. Oh, but I've got a mad customer, you know? Just push it. No, no, if you're, if you're really living your values, I'll take care of the mad customers. We're not going to push uh, what, what a driver can physically do, and we're not going to push what the law uh, says, says that driver can and can't do. You don't compromise values no matter how hot the priority is. You manage the priority, but you can't go around in your organization and talk about safety being a, a, a priority because safety is not a priority, right? Because that means it's capable of changing. That means it's a priority Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I've got a mad customer, so I'm going to look the other way. Safety is a non-negotiable core value 
got to be at the foundation, and you and I have to walk the walk. The rest of the organization has to see us be prepared to say no, prepared to take heat from a customer. They'll follow suit, but we've got to provide the safety leadership. And sometimes it's saying no, sometimes it's having a tough conversation, but it's never saying, you know, violate our safety policy because I've got somebody mad. You don't compromise your values, and that's why safety is not a priority, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a value. And it's critical as you make a transition into the captive um, to know that because ultimately that one compromise that you allow um, could, could cost you a lot, a lot of money and a lot of goodwill. So people talk a lot about culture and safety culture and the importance of culture. What is culture? Well, there's books and books on it. I'm not much for theory. I'm, I'm you know, I consider myself, you know, uh, my, hands are, my hands are in this. It's nothing more than the convergence of the right people and the right process working in harmony. That's when you have a healthy culture. You know, you have great process and the wrong people, uh, you're not gonna accomplish much. You have great people and no process, that's called herding cats, it doesn't work. Here's the problem with process, is that process is often written by folks like us and the average American reads at a fifth or sixth grade level. Tell me how that works. Tell me how you have a process that is not understandable to the people who are actually performing and executing on the process. So we let our front lines, we let our drivers and, and front line dispatchers and managers write our SOPs. Now, we had meetings, we, we uh, talked about them. I had a good writer in the room, so there's always a good writer in the room. But our handbook, which is called the Jetco Way, there's a picture of it later, I doubt we'll get into it. Um, but it's, you know, four or five paragraph sentences. It's full of pictures. It's frontline owned. If you come in and tell me a process is stupid, well, first I can say, well, you know, you wrote it, but I don't. <laughs> um, the, it's, it's, it's in a binder. It's in a binder like this. If the process doesn't make sense, maybe it made sense three years ago. Well, it doesn't today. Fine, great, let's rewrite it. You own it. Tell me what it should be. Tell me what's wrong. Well, hopefully we're getting smarter every day so that what we did three, four, five years ago may not be a best practice anymore. It's living, it's breathing, but it's got to be frontline owned because you give me a 600-page handbook, I'm not going to read it. And neither are your employees. So it's making, it's not just having process. It's not enough. It's making sure you have process that's understandable to the people who are most uh, uh, intimately involved with execution of that process. There's a, mind, a mindset shift that, that's required too as we make our transition into captive insurance. In the old school, safety and operations were at war, right? You know, operations would do what they do until safety catches them. Gone, forget about it. The way to think about it is safety and operations are one in the same. There is no difference. We're all fighting for the same goal. Operations has to be as aligned with safety as the safety department. This is not about cat and mouse. Another important mind shift is this. A lot of, too many of us, when there's a safety problem or concern, we go to the safety department like it's their problem. No, no. Operations, and only operations, whether you're talking about healthcare operations, manufacturing, logistics, whatever, only operations can execute on safety. I mean, who else can execute on safety besides the people with their hands on the levers? Right? So, so you've got to be sure that when I say operations and safety are one and the same, that if there's a safety issue, your safety professionals can teach, coach, train, mentor, right? They, they, they've got an important role. But the minute that we take the responsibility for the execution of safety off of operations, it's not coming back. And those are the only people in our company that can really execute on it day in, day out. And another one is the old school, and I know that we're gonna have unanimous agreement here, right? The old school, safety is a cost. 
The new school is an investment uh, in safety pays huge dividends. Well, we're, we're here, we know that. We know how captive insurance works and that if we do the right thing, the dividends will come our way. Let's quit thinking about it as a cost. I already mentioned to you how customers really look at safety records and, and really care about safety. They don't want to work with rogue operators. <coughs> On top of that, think about employee morale. I mean, to me, investing in safety, and by the way, you know how hard it is to attract good labor. I mean, hiring good people right now, unemployment in this country is so low, right? If unemployment's 4% and 5% of the people in the country are unemployable, tell me how that math works, okay? So the point is that let's attract the best people by investing in safety because it's the ultimate way of saying I care about you. It's the ultimate employee retention tool. Even if it means having a tough conversation here or there, understand that employees need to, un employees need to know that they're cared for. And having a strong, non-negotiable safety culture is the ultimate way to do that. Sometimes it may take a little, under, you know, a little time explaining. I want to talk about power versus authority, and this goes back to frontline engagement. You've got to know who has the power in your company. Um, authority is easy, right? You can give me a title. You can say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, Brian is the vice president of whatever. And send an email out saying, because he's got this title, here are his responsibilities, okay? You gave me authority. You didn't give me a lick of power. Nobody can give me power except me by how I show up. And what we miss a lot of times is the amount of power that lies inside of our front lines. So the key is bringing our frontline opinion leaders, you know, the people that kind of where the rest of the employees go uh, when, when, you know, hey, what's really going on in the company? Those opinion leaders, bring them in. And when we moved into the captive, we did. We, we kind of explained to some of our key drivers, some of our more senior employees, some of our key uh, frontline dispatch customer service people, here's what we're doing, right? It's a whole new level of upside and you know, as we realize that upside, we plan to share it with you. But there is some downside, okay? And we're gonna all share on that too. So we got them involved right away. In our company, you know, if, if we're busy, we never see our drivers, right? If I've got my drivers all at the yard, I've got bigger problems, okay? You know, I could be the safest company in the world if all my trucks were parked. But, <laughs> but what we did is we asked our drivers to elect a driver committee. And the chairman of the driver committee is now full-time uh, in, in the office kind of being a driver advocate. So when there's safety concerns or you know, concerns unrelated to safety, the, uh, the driver committee is involved. We brought the opinion leaders, the people with the real power in, right? We, we took them from the outside inside. And since then, our retention numbers in our industry, right, we're at about 100% if you're average, 100% annual driver turnover, we're at about 18, you know, probably closer to 15 right now. Because we tore down that wall that so often defined, uh, divides um, the, the, the front lines, you know, I, I'm not a fan, in fact, I hate the, I hate the white collar, blue collar terms, to me it's one collar, and, and we tore down those walls and we keep tearing down those walls, and that's what's helped people engage and, and commit to the safety culture. It's not them in the boardroom making decisions. We're all in this together. And, and you, again, as part of being in a captive, I think it's important to say, here's how we're doing. Here's our, our loss reserves. Here's our, here's our equity. And let people know to whatever extent you want. You don't have to give them every detail. But let them know how we're doing and make sure that there's a little bit of that is set aside for them. They are the ones making it happen. Another way to engage the front lines is the stuff doesn't, always, safety can be fun. It doesn't always have to be so serious. I'm a big fan of taking some of your marketing effort and building an internal brand. So our internal brand, um, I may have gone by it too fast or not at all. Um, our internal brand is driving to perfection. Our team came up with that. We came up with some artwork ideas and, um, and, and they came up with uh, driving to perfection and since then, the eternal brand has, has morphed, okay? So you've got driving to perfection. It's a visual affirmation of your values. That's what an internal brand is. It's a visual affirmation of your values. People don't, again, read the signs in the conference room because they don't go in the conference room. But this is on every, the sleeve of every shirt. 
It's on every screensaver. Uh, it's on every truck. You see it before you get in, before you get out. It's uh, forklifts, all the material handling equipment. Um, the co-author of Leading People Safely uh, is a good friend of mine, Jim Schultz. He took waste management on a worst-to-first journey through uh, uh, an invisible, for, uh, building an internal brand called Mission to Zero, right? It wasn't about writing more handbooks. It was about getting the employees and the team to buy on, literally worst-to-first. Uh, and, and Jim tells his story in this book about what he did um, to take a 55,000 employee company on that journey in a relatively short period of time. And if he can do it, we can do it in a lot smaller companies. And he used internal branding heavily. And so, you know, we've, over the years, we've added more brands. We had a wave of uh, these accidents. They come in waves. We were doing a really good job, you know, doing ready, fire, you know, <laughs> aim. And, and for some reason, we kind of just had this collective loss of common sense. So we came up with an internal brand, stop, think, observe, proceed. We, we just reminded people this is the order that we do things, and we were able to use that to kind of restore sanity real quickly. So, and it's fun. People like it. It doesn't always have to be so serious. Again, it gets people to buy in, in in a way they understand. I don't care if you and I understand it. I care if our teams understand it, because I'm expecting that you and I understand it. I think Debbie's uh, conclusion uh, was, was very, very powerful about families. And this is all about families. And what we do every two or three years, and I'm going to have Cheryl just pass, pass a couple of them around, is we have our families, um, have your kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, draw what does safety um, mean to me. And we get some, we get some great artwork. Uh, from kids ages 2 to 18. And uh, it becomes our 2018 calendar. And you see, what this does, so, this, so what you've got is our new calendar. We did this back in 2015. What you've got is this, this convergence of the families, the company, and this is our holiday gift that we're passing around to our customers. So it's not just some guy in a truck, right? We're showing the customer the human side of this too to remind them that you know, our safety and their safety is important. So bringing the families involved, right? We're, we're in an age right now where we're a phone call, email, text message, um, social media post away from our, our friends and family. It doesn't work in a safety sensitive environment. So we've gotta make sure our families understand that when we're, 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 when we're in the zone, when we're performing our mission critical tasks, that um, we need to be left alone. And this is also a good test for me, because when I ask the kids to draw, what I'm looking for is, is this message really getting home? And the artwork tells me, yeah. I mean, it's, it, to, to, to a good extent, it is. Um, but it's a way to bring, bring together your families. That's who we work for. That's who we live for, your customers, your coworkers. Um, so I'm not telling you exactly how to do it, but I'm saying that to really lay a foundation as a captive member, put your spin on it, put your style on it, but ultimately, get everybody involved, and the families are more important than ever because we are too accessible when we're performing safety-sensitive jobs. This is the topic that I'm most interested in. It's about creating a just culture. And a lot of us were raised in an era of progressive discipline. Okay? And I believe that we should get rid of progressive discipline. I think it undermines safety, and I think it undermines our frontline managers. You know, progressive discipline, first time it's a written, a verbal warning, then a written, then maybe I'll send you home, uh, and then you're fired. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm on my second or third strike at your company, my resume is on the street. I'm, I'm already mentally out if I'm not physically out. And the other thing is managers overlook progressive discipline because they don't want to start triggering the clock on good employees. So the way that a lot of us were raised is this. You've been trained. And if you would have done as you would have trained, you wouldn't have made the mistake. You made a mistake, therefore you'll be punished. Kill it. Kill it. Let's change the way that we think about this HR function because it will change the dynamic between our employees and it will change our safety outcomes. You look at it this way. You're human. Humans make mistakes. Now here's the key. And here's, this is the key inquiry. Was it an honest mistake or was it reckless behavior? 
right? If it was an honest mistake, we coach, we teach, we look for failures in the system. If it was reckless behavior, and if it was reckless enough, I mean, if you were doing, you know, 50 in a school zone, I'm not playing three strikes and you're out. One strike is enough. In my company, we have you know, our, our life critical rules. You, who has life critical rules? Okay. Easy thing to do, got to do it. We, we're dying, drowning in rules and regulations. The life critical rules are the ones that are the most important. So our life critical rules are one that are very likely to get you fired. So operating a commercial motor, motor vehicle with a, a cell phone, one strike and you're out. Um, but if we would just take time and, and create an element of fairness, justice in our companies, where employees are less defensive, it's not like being called in the principal's office. If I do something for the, the same th way 15 years, I may make a mistake too, right? I'm not going to hold my frontline employees to a higher standard than I'm holding myself to. So get rid of this, this you know, punish, punish, punish idea. Ask yourself, right, understand and admit that humans are going to make mistakes. Issues are going to happen. Honest or reckless, that's the key inquiry. That will tell you what to do, right? And if it's really reckless, one strike, maybe two. If it was honest, bring the employee along. And that builds trust. And at the foundation of a safety culture has to be that kind of a trust that, you know, I'm not going to get fired for my first safety mistake even though I've been here for 10 years. I'm going to move past this a little bit. <clears throat> and it goes to non-negotiable value alignment. Again, this doesn't, none of these concepts really doesn't matter what business you're in. I'm coming from a logistics background. I used to practice law, so you know, I've been all over the place. This work, healthcare, logistics, it doesn't matter. You have to have clear value alignment, right? Safety, then production, then everything else. Can you rearrange those blocks in a way that, that, that will give you a safe outcome? It's impossible. The problem is that too often, you know, there are so many messages coming from our companies, right? HR sends an email today about this, the CEO or the president about that tomorrow. Employees get mixed messages. Hey, the customer's really mad. You know, we gotta take care of this. I don't care what it takes, just get it done, okay? You may not have meant to say compromise safety, but if I'm the employee and you tell me, Brian, whatever it takes, just get it done, that's what I'm gonna do. So you, you've got to make sure that this, this risk of the mixed messages is replaced with value alignment. And, and where we don't negotiate safety. I'm gonna just run past this and I've got one more slide I wanna go to, if this lets me. Um, and the, the, the last slide is metric based and it's this. As we move into a captive or mature into a captive, I want you to take the word safety and compliance out of your vocabulary. Safety is here, compliance is here. Um, I take, I've taken a traditional safety function and broken it down to three clear areas. Incident and claims management, right? We have to know what we're doing there, but we don't necessarily want to have that much experience at it. And then regulatory compliance, if you want to be in business, we're going to comply with the regulations. But think about this. Regulations often prescribe the bare minimum. And quite frankly, a regulator can't tailor regulations to our exact business. So a lot of them, we comply because we have to, but they don't drive um, uh, results. You know, so regulations in and of themselves, I believe, don't make you safer. So I think some regulations are fantastic. Finally, we're going to have ELDs, required electronic logging devices required in trucks. Fantastic regulation. Not all are like that. The real action is in the green. It's behavior management. It's management by walking around. Field behavior, okay? It's near miscommunication. Close calls, right? Capture the accident that didn't happen so you can prevent it from happening. So make sure that people can report near misses without fear of retribution. If there's a close call and if, if you know, my hands were on the wheel, okay. I reported it, I may need to get remedial training, but I can have, there's gonna be no fear of retribution. So we've gotta stay on the, on the cutting edge. And in that arena, do not be afraid of technology. Being afraid of technology is sort of like being afraid of change. We put forward 
we put cameras in our trucks. They face forward, uh, out, out the truck, and, and at the driver so we can see what goes on behavior-wise if there's an incident. Well, you know, you can imagine that, 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 that didn't necessarily win any sort of popularity contests until uh, the vast majority of the camera incidents that we've had have favored the driver. It proved that he or she was driving professionally compared to maybe what the other vehicle was doing. And now, all of a sudden, it's uh, 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 very, very popular. So the idea is don't be afraid of technology. Um, and with that, a lot more we can go over, but it's going to be in the book. And I'll be around if you want to talk about it. I just want to end with one thought, which is from my favorite uh, athlete, Muhammad Ali. It's the repetition of affirmation that lead to belief. Once the belief becomes a conviction, things begin to happen. And that's really what it's all about. That's the journey that, that we're on. And with that, I thank you for your time and uh, hope this uh, was helpful as, as we transition and grow into a captive. Gordy? Good afternoon. As Mel had anxiety of flying, I think I have anxiety of this clicker, so we'll see where it takes us. Oh, not bad. Anyways, I'm just going to elaborate on a couple key points Brian talked about and then talk about resources in order to make that, that jump from being a, a purchaser of insurer to an owner, such as in a captive program. You know, Brian spoke about three key points early on in his presentation. He asked these three questions. How strong is your safety culture? Number two, are you really living your values? And last but not least, are you providing leadership? What you want to do if you're thinking about uh, joining a captive and you're currently just buying insurance through the, the extraditional means, I should say, is, is do you have the right elements in place to make it happen? And you need to find resources, whether it's through a captive manager, whether it's through your brokerage community, whether it's through a safety consultant such as a Gallagher Bassett. What you want to do is find some resources that can help you prepare yourself to join a captive, because as Brian said, he had to make a reinvestment in the safety culture of his organization when he joined the captive. And the reason being is, you know, the direct benefits then re rewards the company versus the quote unquote insurance company. So what we do as a resource, and, and I put it as the bottom as a tagline, what consultants really should be doing is focusing on developing, implementing, and monitoring your loss control initiatives. So that in essence, you have a better safety culture. That's what we're looking for when we're thinking or we're prospecting a potential captive. We're hired by captive managers to evaluate the companies consider joining to determine if they're the right fit. So what you need to do as an individual is, number one, find out the type of captive you're thinking of joining and find out about the metrics and the nuances of the captives. Different captives have different flavors. For example, some may be big in substance abuse. You have to have a policy before you join. Distracted driving has spoken about this morning. There's captives that if you don't have that policy, you're not going to join. So you need to find out what, the, what the, the expectations is of the captive. Work with whoever your captive manager, your broker is to determine the next steps, the next strategies to whether or not this is a proper fit for you. From a risk control and safety perspective, exactly what Brian spoke about, I tied in some words to what he, he spoke about. The first thing we look for is the values of the organization. We look at the safety management and we look at how it's run. It's really interesting. You can go to a lot of companies and they have all the policies, whether it's a healthcare or nursing facility, whether it's a trucking company, whatever it is, they have all the policies in the world. As a consultant, one of our objectives is, is to determine are they actually being applied? Do people really know what's going on? So we focus a lot of our energy in just determining the behavioral aspects of the organization. I know at the National Safety Council, just to give a plug, since it's not for my company, but for the National Safety Council, they have a great behavior check by a perception survey that they offer. And that's something that you should look at if you're determining, are my employees really safety engaged? Do they really understand? Do they really tie in with the frontline managers? So that's something to take back. You can look at on your own leisure, but that is something that is available. We also look at, of course, compliance. Again, whether you're healthcare, whether you're a hospital, whether you're a manufacturer or a, a C-store, 
we look at the regulatory compliance, um, both being from EPA, OSHA, any of the, the uh, care uh, initiatives out there, um, the list goes on and on. Of course, your consultant should have some expertise in that area. So naturally, if we're doing something with trucking, we're gonna send someone in with some DOT experience as an example for a, a case like Brian's company. But what we're really trying to determine is what are the priorities of the organization and where does the rubber hit the road? In other words, they can talk it, but do they actually practice it? Your consultant should help you determine that and if you're ready to join a captive. Um, the other thing we look at is programs, policies. What we're really looking for there when we're looking at policies and procedures, uh, if you're thinking of joining a captive, whether it be acts investigation, claim management, whether it be regulatory on lockout, tagout, whatever the case may be, bloodborne pathogens, you name it. What we're looking for is not just the policy, we're looking for the sustainability of that policy. You know, it's interesting, a lot of times we go out to organizations and, and the policies are 8, 10, 12 years old. Um, and you know that they're not being used, okay? So you need, we, we check those things out with you. Um, I, I talk about supervisory training. We like to see a lot of supervisory training. We, we, we provide that as well as any consultant does. What we're trying to do there is most, most consultants are only there for limited engagement. So the objective of your consultant, whether you're thinking of joining a captive or not, is again for the longevity of your program. The old adage, give someone a fish, they eat for today, teach them how to fish, they eat for a lifetime. The objective of a consultant should be to come into your organization and teach you how to fish, all right? Basically, you work yourself out of a job, as Andy and I always kid about. So that's something you need to be thinking about and looking at. We do evaluations, assessments, and surveys. We can do mock OSHA assessments. We can do a lot of different things. Usually, we'll conduct assessments for the purpose of determining when you're having losses, is it risk or is it chance to what Brian spoke about earlier? You know, do they have the proper protocol in place? Is the, are the employees engaged? Is front uh, line management a part of the process? It's not something in a tower, it's done throughout the organization. Let's see if I get lucky here. Oh man, that five, five, three, two, one really works. <laughs> All right, come on, work with me. We're almost done here. All right, last slide, I promise you. Then we'll go to Q&A real quick and we'll wrap it up because we're right on time and I'm gonna try and get on time delivery. So anyways, looking at a captive, one of the first things a consultant should be doing is looking at three to five years of loss experience. The idea is, you know, you can have a bad year to Brian's case earlier. You could have a bad loss in one year in auto. Next year it could be work comp. When you look at the ratio as a whole, it's not bad. What we're doing is looking for trends, some problems, some hot spots because that'll focus us on what we're gonna try and gear and try and improve within your organization so that you can elect potentially to join a captive at a later date. Um, you know, we, we normally focus in on the work comp GL and auto portions for the most part from, from our consulting practice. But when we're looking at, at the actual safety programs and the practices, these are the key elements we're looking at. We're looking at the loss prevention direction to exactly what Brian talked about. Probably about 30% of the weighted value of your organization, maybe 40%, is on management, involvement, and safety culture. All the rest is window dressing because things change. I don't want someone telling me that there's a cord on the floor, it's a trip hazard. I wanted someone to tell me why is that place there in the first place. I want to take it to that next step. So what we're always doing is looking at what are you doing from a cultural aspect to make sure you're a good safety risk, okay? It's not just about checking the boxes. Claims management, we're looking for a partnership in the claims management world. And the idea behind that is as a captive owner, you have to invest yourself in making sure you have a good safe uh, location <laughs> as well as one, should there be an accident the willing participation to get involved. It makes a tremendous impact. Just on lag time alone, you can save numerous amounts of dollars each and every year on being aggressive in your claim handling. So we look at the claim management practices, return to work policies, and all the different aspects of that. Next, of course, is regulatory compliance. It's always nice to be safe. Doesn't necessarily draw where all the losses are occurring. So we do just make sure you got your I's dotted and your T's crossed. 
We look at liability, usually when we're looking at a potential captive, if, if it's gonna be multi-line. We're looking at premises liability, of course, product liability. We'll do a quick check, certificates of insurance, and how you're transferring risks to your partners, contractors, vendors, et cetera, just to get, get a spot check on that, to make sure you have a pulse on that. Some interesting things come up from time to time. Motor vehicle, again, we, we will look at your fleet records, what you're doing, do you have distracted driving, do you have motor vehicle record checks, do you have a drive cam system. We're looking at what are some of the things you're doing to prevent loss. And then last but not least, we look at emergency response. Should you have the tragic situation or the injury, how are you willing to respond? How do you work within your community? What are your, your objectives in getting back to sustainability? Those are the types of things we're looking at. And the most important thing is, you know, we're making sure that you're a proper fit for that captive to which we're usually engaged from a captive manager to look at you as a prospect. We kind of understand what they're looking for. So we're always focused in on that. But are you a proper fit for the captive? And, you know, to my point here is, you know, to what Brian spoke about is we're really looking at what the culture of the fiber of the organization is. Because, you know, culture is, you know, what you're doing when no one's looking. And we're trying to peek under the sheets to find out what's going on to determine if you're a right fit for a captive. With that, I'll conclude it. Turn it back over to Andy. Thanks, Gary. Well done. It's not very often we see people coming in at the end of the session. So they must have heard it was really going well in here. So uh, we have uh, time for some questions for uh, Brian, Gordy, myself about uh, the, the captive, the resources you need to bring to bear to become an owner mentality instead of a, an insurance buyer mentality or anything for Brian about his operations and his uh, path that, that he went on that uh, from, from good to great from owner to, uh, from buyer to owner. So any questions? Anything? We're out of time. Brian, thank you very much for being a part of this. And don't forget to come up and see him. We've got a few books still. So uh, thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate you being a part of this. Thank you.